Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, I'm uh, pleased, pleased that so many people are interested in uh, the, the talk. Uh, I have to apologize a little bit. I, I'm not giving the talk I planned. In fact, I gave the talk, I, I, I figured I talked uh, um, uh, 34 years ago in Bryn Mawr. I have to explain to you how old I am, so you excuse my uh, mistakes. 34 years ago at Bryn Mawr, and I thought things haven't changed uh, since then, and I could give, give, give the same talk again. And, it, and it's not a bad talk, and it's in a paper, so it's in uh, the, the, the proceedings of that uh, uh, symposium in honor of Emmy Noether's 100th birthday. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, the reason the talk is different is when preparing for this talk, I actually looked at her paper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, uh, for that I actually ha have to thank the librarian here for uh, getting me an English translation because that was not so easy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, after wading through this uh, paper, I'm not sure whether the English translation is much improvement over the German. But that's, uh, and um, I read or tried to read the paper, and it's very interesting, and it's not what you think it's going to be at all. And so I'm going to tell you roughly, I'm not going to tell you all of what's in the paper because I simply can't understand it. It's, she's an algebraist, she does calculations in algebra and does not think the way someone who's more used to geometry does, but uh, I will at least tell you what she says and uh, explain why she said it. So the first thing I'm, this is by the way, okay, so the, I wrote down the basic kind of calculations in the uh, uh, calculus of variations, which is roughly the way she writes it down, okay? Except that there are a few, I've skipped on indices and everything, and uh, she doesn't use the standard capital D for many derivatives here, with the alpha here, I should say, is indexed by alpha one through alpha, I think it's K, K is the order there. And the absolute value is the sum of, uh, of those. And it means, uh, it means you differentiate uh, alpha 1 times in x1, alpha 2 times in x2, and alpha k times in xk. And uh, it's, it's a little bit bewildering uh, why you bother with this, since all the uh, examples are with alpha equal 1. And uh, so there are a few exotic examples where alpha is actually 2, but it's not. So the basic idea of the calculus of variations is we have a function of a certain number of derivatives. Oh, we, have a function, we have functions f from uh, Rn to Rm, and you can fix it up so there's manifolds involved and so forth, but there's no, that's, there's no point to that. And uh, th we have a Lagrangian, which is a function of, of the independent variable and a certain number of derivatives of the dependent variable. And we're interested in the action integral, which is the integral of L over a domain in Rn. Or if you're, you could do it on a manifold if you want. That's not really relevant to my talk. And what we're going to do is we're going to not look for minima, minima of this because that, that's not really what's concerned. We're going to look for critical points of A as a function of S, that is the action integral as a function of the variable F. And we, we go through a calculation of computing the derivative. This is this is actually the derivative. This is a single derivative. It's the derivative of epsilon at epsilon equals 0 of A of, uh, of family F of E, where this is the variation. This is sometimes called the variation of F. Uh, and so it's an ordinary derivative. We, of course, it's all formal. We exchange the, the uh, derivative with the integral. And we arrive at. Uh, a f term like this, which doesn't need too much, and then we integrate by parts. If you're fancy, you call it Stokes' theorem, but in one dimension, you call it integration by parts, so we're calling it integration by parts. So that's, and so you integrate by parts, and you get two terms, one of which manifestly keeps 
all the divergences, namely all the terms in this, in this, all the expressions in this uh, have uh, total derivatives of the function. And th this term here contains the Euler-Lagrange equations. So what we do is we say, oh yeah, well we're taking all variations, so we'll take variations with compact support. Actually, Emmy Nunta couldn't take uh, variations with compact support because everything's analytic. But she had her variations <laughs> to, uh, uh, disappear up to a, the, k, the order k on the boundary. Okay, So this term goes away. And we're left with the fact that this term is 0 for all variations with, as I said, the vanish to a certain order on the boundary. And then we get what's called the Euler-Lagrange equations. I, I, she seems to call these Lagrangian expressions, interestingly enough. So uh, the Euler-Lagrange is reasonable. Now in all the examples, well, it's not going to be true. I'm going to show you an example where alpha is the size of alpha is 2. But usually, the absolute value of alpha is 1. And the, P, the PIs, which are involved in this integration by parts term that we're, we throw away to get the Euler-Lagrange equations, the PIs just have a form like this. So they're easily calculable in the case that we aren't using a lot of derivatives. But I sort of, so that's the worst part of the talk, all those derivatives and everything like that. <laughs> so, so the next thing we'll do is we'll do an example, OK? And so, the, and, and so you, you will, we'll, we'll actually do two, two examples. But I have, an example is the two-body problem, which uh, which I hope most of you know what the two-body problem is. But uh, the two-body problem, uh, if, if we're here, uh, we're, uh, we're going to call Fy, because uh, y is a point. So here we have two, the position of two uh, y, y2 uh, is a map from time r into space, which is r3. Uh, and that we'll call this time, and we'll call the variables y. Now, the kinetic energy for this is one half the mass of the two, uh, the the mass times the uh, velocity squared plus y prime squared. Uh, did I? Yeah. No. Sorry. Let me. Uh, that's right. Plus uh, m2 y2 prime squared. And the potential energy for this problem, v, is minus m1 m2 times the gravitational constant times uh, the absolute value y1 minus y2. Okay. Now, the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics is via the calculus of variations and so it's it, which made it a uh, a really important uh, ingredient in uh, 19th century uh, math mathematics and the Lagrangian formulation says take as the Lagrangian the kinetic energy minus the potential energy okay there are many fa fancier Lagrangians but if you're uh, and uh, uh, the oil and Lagrange equations come out. Uh, uh, I'll call this E1 because I need an expression for this. This is my, uh, minus m1 y double prime plus 1 m2 g times y1 minus y2 over y1 minus y2. And of course, the same thing, the expression here. I just need this for notational purposes, y, uh, y1, y2 double prime, symmetric in y1 and y2, g, y2, y1, y1, two, cubed. OK. So what do we do with these equations? Well, we don't just solve, as you know, ordinary differential equations. Oh, this is equal 0. This is oil or branch. So how do we solve them? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, and don't give this as a, uh, uh, an exercise to your class without telling, well, without telling them how to write in lips down uh, uh, with the foci as a center, which is not 
<laughs> completely straight known to most uh, students. Anyway, so the first thing we'll do is we're going to find the conservation of energy. And so what we do for conservation of energy is we multiply the uh, oil, first oil of the Lagrange equation uh, by uh, y1. And we take the second Euler Lagrange equation and we multiply it by y2 prime. And of course, this is equal to 0. Then we miss, well, because E1 and E2 are 0, so the whole thing's equal to 0. Then we massage it a little bit, OK? And you don't, so you, we massage it a little bit. And my, minus, lo and behold, we find that minus K prime minus V prime is equal to 0. It, uh, that's, it's the sign convention I've been using. Very good. Conservation of energy. So now you see why we had the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, not the sum. So that's, and so this, now the, the, the second thing we do is we actually look for linear momentum. And so what we take is we take the oil, first oil of the Lagrange equation and we multiply it by uh, the uh, uh, basis vector in the i-th direction, and we take the second oil of the Lagrange equation, and we multiply it by the b same basis vector, another, uh, and we set that equal to zero. And lo and behold, we discover that m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime as vectors are equal zero. I mean, I, I, I just, uh, so if you, in other words, this really says uh, is equal to a constant. Sorry, did I? No, a constant. Because somebody stopped me. <laughs> and this is equal to a constant. Stop me, please. Oh, the derivative is zero. Ah, yes, 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 yes. The derivative is zero. And this is constant. OK, the derivative of this is zero is just the sum of the Euler Lagrange equations. OK, and the third thing we do is we take the first Euler-Lagrange equation and we uh, I, I, we uh, we cross it with y1 uh, and we add it to the second Euler-Lagrange equation. We cross it with y2 and we set that equal to zero. And lo and behold, we get conservation of angular momentum, which is m1 uh, y uh, sorry cross with i1 prime sorry primes. So lo and behold, no. Y1, sorry, Y2. Uh, and, and lo and behold, we get conservation of angular momentum, which is uh, Y1 prime Y2 plus M2 times Y2, uh, Y2 prime plus Y2 uh, is constant. So these are these are two. This is this is a time. Uh, now the question is, what did I just do? So this is how you solve the classical two-body problem, and this is how you actually approach all the standard classical problems in mechanics. Okay. Did I? Uh, What did I do wrong? I'm sure you're right. It's, no, it's my it's either v1 plus m2, m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals constant, or m v1 prime plus m2 v prime equals zero. No, no, this is, oh, 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 m. I'm sorry, it's y1. I don't have any v's. I don't have any v's. I, I, thank you. I don't have any v's. That's, <laughs> that's all right. OK. So the question is, what did I do? Why? What, what did I do? I mean, so let me give you another example because uh, this is example two, which uh, uh, of the calculus of variations problem. And uh, example two is uh, a field theory problem, OK? And here, the second example, we're just going to map, we take F mapping R and to R. And we'll choose as the Lagrangian of F. Uh, and I, I, I didn't put the halves in here. The absolute value of the derivative of f. And then I'll throw in a nonlinear term that will make it an equ equation. And I'll throw in an equation like that. Actually, Nurder wouldn't have liked this, because my p's are not all uh, integers, are not all, are not all uh, 
uh, uh, even integers. Okay. And so the, uh, so the oil and Lagrange equations for this are minus 2 Laplacian of f plus p lambda f p minus 2 f equals 0. Okay. So what are we going to do with these equations? And this, of course, is not quotes in the sense of the ordinary differential equation. But what we're going to actually do is we're going to take the oil. So let's write this. As, that this is the oil Lagrange equation. Uh, and so we, what we actually do is we do exactly the sort of thing we did, did it up there. We take the oil Lagrange equation and we multiply it by the derivatives of f. And we have lots of derivatives of f. Let me just uh, let me just call that. And I put a little hat over that to indicate it's a different the, there's a derivative in the Euler Lagrange equation. And this is just another set of, deri of vector derivatives. So and you set that equal to zero. And again, uh, you massage this a little bit, okay? And you get minus two times the divergence of df f uh, plus I'll just f squared. So you get an equation that looks like this. Now this equation is this equation of a divergence is actually a vector equation for divergences and it has in it this unknown a tensor here. So we set the, the a, a tensor. Uh, I'll, I'll write it uh, t, and I'll write it in indices so that you can. This is actually equal to this derivative in the x direction times the derivative in the y direction, and then there's a two here minus and plus uh, uh, the the Lagrangian. I'm even going to put the Lagrangian in here uh, times the Kronecker delta symbol. And so this T is uh, an energy momentum tensor. And uh, uh, th this is uh, considered basic to uh, uh, field theory, uh, equations of field theory. So uh, now. Uh, what is Nurtis theorem? So the claim is, is I'm going to explain. Oh, and now I have to tell you why this is a conservation law. OK. So the, the, uh, why, why is T a conservation law? So uh, the, the point is, is the divergence of T, uh, and I'll put a dot here, is equal to 0. This means that if I have an n minus, uh, m n minus 1 sitting in my uh, uh, sitting in my w I in my independent variables, then I, it makes sense to integrate t over m n minus one, and this is what would be called a charge. There's a charge for every direction. There's, there's not that charge. We hope that charge isn't zero because that's going to tell us interesting things. And uh, so th but the important thing is, is that the integral over the boundary of t is actually 0. So actually, I worked it out, but uh, let's see. How am I doing? OK. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the, oh, well, I might, which is by the divergence theorem, divergence of t over m. Uh, actually, omega. We're still in Euclidean space, so I don't equal zero. So this is th this provides, for instance, if I if I want to uh, interpret con a conservation of energy, let me change my Euclidean space to. Uh, it, this is all formal, so it doesn't really matter whether I'm working in Lorentz space or Euclidean space. And if I if I let x one be a time variable. And I look, I take as the n minus 1 uh, as a function of t is equal to the variable t uh, x2 xn, right? Uh, what I will actually get 
when I write this down, uh, I can also rewrite this as the integral over the manifold at time t of uh, at little t of time t uh, d dt is equal to zero. And so this is the form that you would actually look at a conservation law. It says as you move the, manif the manifold through space, it bounds. So you're, you're thinking of this as being the space between. And the, the value of the charge here is the same as the value of the charge here. And so uh, you get a cons conserved charge of whatever you're calling the charge. Actually, that's energy and if I take the time direction. And if I take the x directions, I would be getting momentum, conservation of momentum. So that's, so that's why, in other words, in field theory, in high, and when you're doing partial differential equations instead, instead of ordinary differential equations, the classically divergent free vector fields are the replacement for uh, the, the uh, conserved quantities in, for mechanics and in, one, and in, two, and in uh, ordinary differential equations problems. So that's what a conservation law is. So we're so uh, now now to continue the explanation of what the what the mysterious mysterious thing I did before is I have to tell you what uh, suppose we have a group G and we want to say what does it mean for the Lagrangian? Oh, sorry. So I have to draw a picture here. We have a group G, and elements of the group G I've called sigma, and uh, I, sigma are a map from the Rn to Rn, and it's covered by a map from the manifold that I ma mapped into here, and we have and we have functions that map Rn to n. And we, ha we induce sigma star of f uh, is just f composed with sigma composed with sigma hat. So in other words, we, we uh, uh, right, uh, why have I done This is sigma star of f. So, if we have if we have a group acting on Rn and or on the uh, uh, dependent variables, we can construct a family of functions. And of course, if uh, just to illustrate, if this group depends on a, uh, we write write the variable down as a one-parameter group, then we have that the derivative uh, in epsilon of sigma of epsilon is a vector field down here. And uh, the derivative in the direction of epsilon, at, uh, sorry, epsilon equals 0, epsilon equals 0, of sigma epsilon star of f is a variation. It's a phi of the type that I actually used back there. But it's not a legitimate phi, OK? It's not legitimate because it moves domains downstairs. Remember down uh, uh, when, when I so it is, does not vanish on the boundary. This is something that puzzled me when I was a graduate student. I really couldn't understand how you could do the calculus of variations and you had all the variations vanish on the boundary. And in in the Noether theorem and the group, you you definitely don't want them to. So uh, phi epsilon does not is not equal to zero. So the Lagrangian is invariant under such a thing in the usual way that uh, 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 element of a group, uh, that is, if phi star, phi, if sigma star of L of F is just equal to L, and again, sigma of F. Now, we actually only need the derivative of this equation. We do not need a group action. We need a representation of the Lie algebra into the space of variations. 
However, if you have any experience doing these problems, there is absolutely no way on earth to understand whether you have a representation of a, uh, Lie, of a Lie algebra in, on, a, on a Lagrangian that's leaving it fixed. It's a mess. It's very easy to see when a group leaves something fixed. I mean, so, so uh, I, I, she does discuss what happens when you have a, 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 just the, the Lie algebra act. So in, 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 in any case, right now, we, have, we actually obtained a representation of the Lie algebra of the group. And I'll just write it down uh, into the variations, variations of f. I don't know which I'll call. B, oh, sorry, b, c. That's what I'm calling it. OK. Well, I got there so far. OK. So Nertes theorem uh, says that if you have a Lagrangian, that it's very inver invariant under a group G with a Lie algebra, then there exists a map of, uh, from the solutions of the Euler Lagrange equations and the and uh, the Lie variations of the, uh, in the direction of the Lie algebra into conservation laws. That is, into if you want to do it classically, vector fields, the divergence of which is zero. If you want to do it in modern notation, you just put it, make it an n minus one form. I mean, that's it's not it's not that, that's a technical and very mild difference. It's, and. This is linear in the Lie algebra. You can see by the computations of everything. And it's very nonlinear in the solutions of the, uh, in the, the Euler Lagrange equations. OK, well, so now we know what we did, though. OK? <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm supposed, did I? Oh, I didn't write down yet what the formula was. Well. Uh, let's see, I put that here. Sorry, I have to mess this up now. Uh, OK. And what, it, what is the formula for this divergence-free vector field? The formula for the divergence-free vector field, uh, which I'll call T of A, is this P that I wrote over there, minus nu minus the Lagrangian times the vector field. I've written it in coordinates again. I mean, I can write, I can write a coordinate free, but it's just going to be. And so uh, in other words, when I go back over here and look at the p I wrote down, uh, the p, uh, sorry, I, ha I better put in the f p of phi sub a is equal to phi times the variation. Sorry, I forgot to do that. No, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. No, that's not right. Now I'm confused. That's not right, so I'll figure out why it's not right. Uh, okay. Well, in any case, let me let me go on, and I'll find in my, uh, where I am in my notes at some point. Uh, uh, so we know what we did, though. What we did here was we used the uh, invariance in time and applied Nertes theorem just by the book. So this is invariance in time. This is translation invariance. And this is wrote uh, Wait, wait a minute. Where did I, oh, wait a minute. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm on the wrong page. Uh, 
It's on the right side. Yeah. It's over here. Okay. Okay. So this was time translation. Uh, this was invariance in time. This was invariance in uh, uh, translations in space. And uh, this was invariance with under all of the spheric rotational group. Okay, so we now know what we did. I mean, that's that's, uh, and uh, um, <coughs> now here we did exactly the same thing. It's just a little bit more complicated. We used the fact that the uh, the that the Lagrangian is invariant under. Uh, either it's uh, time and space translations or all space translations, depending on how you want to do it. And uh, not only that, so we actually understood uh, what we did here. Now, it's clear, uh, it's a little difficult for me because the references are almost impossible to track down. Uh, it's fairly clear that uh, mathematicians and physicists understood this conservation of energy being associated to time and just trans uh, translations in time and uh, the uh, linear momenta uh, tra uh, translations in space and angular momenta rotations. It's fairly clear that they actually understood this because you'll, you'll see in a minute. Now, when I actually looked at her theorem, and I'll, I'll explain here. Um, I, I, it's mystifying because in the statement of the theorem, she says there's a converse. There first, there's two things that, and uh, uh, in the proof of the theorem, a great deal goes into proving uh, linear independence if you have a group. You don't want, you want the, the representation of the Lie algebra to be li uh, linear independent conservations, well, not the same one again. And uh, so, and she also says there's a converse. Now, there's no statement of exactly what the hypotheses are, and I can't quite make out what she's saying, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, about that now. So why did she actually do this prob problem? This is, uh, and the, why, she, why, why she did this problem uh, is, uh, just intimately tied up in the fact that it was the paper was written in 1918, and Einstein had uh, had um, announced the theory of uh, relativity in 1915. Uh, Einstein theory of relativity, and soon after, and again, I cannot. I can't find the paper, so it's uh, Hilbert gave the uh, Hilbert uh, gave the variational formulation of uh, of uh, the variational formulation. formulation. And now uh, let me remind you then that the action integral for general relativity is a function of, of something that I'll call G, which is the metric tensor, and it's the integration over, well, he, he wants R4. We don't really care what dimension. I'm a mathematician. Mathematicians sure. always work in Rn. I mean, <laughs> so of the scalar curvature uh, times the metric, the, the uh, measure that comes from the metric. So here, G, I'm, I'm using this as, as the d determinant of uh, G to the n over 2. Okay. And that for, so there's a variational formulation, and that the Euler Lagrange equations for this uh, actually equal when you actually compute them. Uh, th this is, would be very well known that the very. No, 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 it's scalar curvature, R is scalar curvature. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, and if you if you take the variations of this, and I'll I'll, I'll misuse this as phi, uh, you'll actually actually get the integral over r of phi times uh, Ricci curvature. Uh, phi here is uh, I'll, uh, this this is this is upper end is. Ricci curvature is lower in disease, but actually we don't need to worry about that. P times Ricci curvature. And actually, I had no idea of whether there was an integration by parts term. Okay, so you just, you just learned from me that Nurture's theorem comes from the term that comes from integration by parts. But lo and behold, if you look in Mr. Thorne and Wheeler years, they do in, in, indeed admit that there's an integration by parts term, which has the form of some sort of uh, uh, divergence. And it's a divergence of the variation, in case you're interested in the, uh, it's the divergence of something that's the variation, the connection one form. Connection one forms are actually tensors because they're variations of, of uh, I mean, connection, the variations of a connection is actually a one form. So uh, actually, there's a G here and a D here so forth, but I actually would be a little like that. So there is indeed a divergence, which looks very hard to compute. But now, the reason that Nurta actually did this problem was that Hilbert was very distressed by the lack of an energy momentum tensor for general relativity. So in other words, general relativity is invariant. It certainly is invariant uh, under uh, translations of space-time, right? So there should be, a, a, according to what we just do, and what they, see, they knew at the time, is there was supposed to be an energy momentum tensor. And they couldn't find the energy momentum tensor. A lot of this, by the way, is inferred from, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, but it's, it's fairly clear that Hilbert had, had uh, and so the question was, where, where is the uh, uh, energy uh, momentum tensor? And so he assigned Nurta the uh, he gave this problem to Nurta, uh, which she solved. In other words, Nurta solved this. Solved this. And I, I fear I don't quite understand. What she proves is that if you have a finite dimensional Lie group of the type of translations. That, sit, that sits in an infinite dimensional group of, of invariance group of a certain type, then you will not have conservation laws. And she actually proves this in great detail in the paper. She explains in great, in other words, the paper is mainly an explanation of why there are no, and there's no energy momentum tensor for general relativity. And uh, so solve this and, sh and showed, and showed, that not all group actions have conservation laws. But in order, she calls it an improper action. Uh, but they all have to sit, you have to have an, in, in order for this to be true, her claim is you have to have an infinite dimensional invariance group of the sort that you have in general relativity. So I'm, my goal is to actually try to understand uh, what, what, what she did. Now, wait a minute, let me. Uh, okay. Now, uh, it's actually quite, uh, there, for, for a modern mathematician, actually, uh, you don't have to go through all this computation. The first point is is that uh, if Einstein's, if the Ricci curvature is zero, there's no tensor that could be invariant tensor uh, to be to be invariant under the diffeomorphism group. It has to be a tensor, and there isn't any tensor around to be the energy momentum tensor. So you can kind of conclude immediately why there isn't. Uh, but the, uh, there's also an easy proof. That is, when you actually look at the variation now of R, G, uh, we take the variation of this in the direction of a vector field, which is, after all, vector field is the infinitesimal transformation 
of a uh, uh, d x to the n, right? Uh, you actually, uh, oh, sorry, I'm really getting out of time. Sorry, before I do this, I need to actually prove Nutter's theorem for you. Okay, that's not very hard, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, You think I would have re remember? You think I learned a lecture from notes? Uh, the problem is, is that when you're young, you don't need to lecture from notes, and when you get old, you have no habit from lecturing to notes, and so you can't. You don't know how to do it. <laughs> Even though, so you. So anyway, what's the proof of notice here? Uh, I, ne I need. I need that for. Proof of Nutter's theorem. So it's, it's slightly out of order, Nutter's theorem. Well, remember that uh, the, the, the domain, so what we do is we, 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 we take the, the, this, uh, we compute the variation in two ways. Variation of, of, um, the action integral, integral in the direction of the variation in the, for, for, for the uh, sig, uh, sigma, uh, uh, we compute it in two ways. Remember that d, so the variation uh, in the first place, and this is, this is the easiest one to understand of L, well, the variation of L would be zero, except we're moving the, the we're moving the domain that we're. So if we, when we actually compute the variation of that, we will actually get the integral over the, ba I mean, it's easier for me to understand this way. You'll actually get the integral of the, uh, of, uh, the normal to the boundary uh, 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 over the boundary. I mean, that's easier for me to see immediately. But I think if you're really used to, used to doing field theory, you know that this is also automatically the divergence of L times the uh, vector field. So one way of, this, this doesn't give us Nernest theorem, but it tells us one way to compute the variation. Now we compute the other variation by the long Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay, so we now we now compute the variation in the second way, uh, d a, and this is actually equal to uh, uh, the integral over omega of uh, d. Uh, I'll just write it as d p alpha d alpha uh, of phi sigma, uh, and. Right, there's no phi alpha in this. I, I, I see what happened. And now we remember that we had two terms here. We got a term that satisfied the oil Lagrange. And of course, that's, we're, on a, we're on, on a solution. So the oil Lagrange equation is zero. And we had this other term. And I, I particularly wrote it as the divergence of an object P. Now is the p here? I should write p of phi because it's it's a and, and uh, no, notice I did want to point out that this is not unique. The divergence p is not unique, but if you check in the way I've written the formula, it it uh, it differs. If you th think of it as an n minus one form, it differs by d of an n minus two form. So if you're high, for the higher orders, the, the, p, the p isn't unique. So now we have our, uh, so now we just notice that we have this tensor, uh, the integral of omega of the divergence of p minus L sigma is equal to zero. And so our conservation law is equal to p minus L v. OK. So that's, that's where. Now, in Einstein's equation, so the question is what went wrong with Einstein's equation? I guess I started to do it and I lost, got lost. OK, well, the, the, this way it can't go wrong, right? So I, 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 uh, uh, the first way it can't go wrong. So we, uh, the, the first way of the d of, of the action integral 
is actually equal to the integral of r, uh, the, sorry, the divergence of r g uh, times the vector field. Okay, it's integration by parts. Okay, and so that that's the same as it was. But now we wanted to compute dA the other way. But R is actually a function. It's, function of, it's a function of tensors. So we know how to compute its variation. We don't have to go through the Euler-Lagrange equations and all that stuff. We know that if we take the derivative of A, that uh, it, the derivative of A, it has a term with Ricci curvature in it which is the one that gave the Euler-Lagrange equation in it. And it also has a term uh, with the derivative uh, of r in the direction of the vector field. Because r, r, r be, that's, that's. And so the two pieces that we got are the same. And so we end up with. Not only do we end up with an ineffective vector field, uh, uh, I mean ineffective, ineffective conservation law, we get absolutely no, we get nothing. Okay. Now, the next question is, and I'm sure people have addressed this, but it's worth doing. Now you look at this. Actually, Nerta gives some other examples where the conservation law doesn't work out. But again, I I I, I wasn't able to actually follow what she was doing. But now we know another example, because we know the gauge theories are actually, in some ways, very similar to variational problems. So, the, so let's look at the Yang-Mills functional. This is something which has a very large group of uh, symmetries. The Yang-Mills functional, uh, the action integral for that, well, I better put my f is equal to a connection uh, equal d plus a. And the Lagrangian is, oh, the curvature of the connection uh, f uh, a is d a squared. And the Lagrangian for Yang-Mills theory is the square norm, the trace norm of the curvature, uh, which if you actually want to compute it is uh, uh, minus the trace of f a wedge star a, if you want to. Uh, this is uh, so, so. And it has a very large group of symmetries. Uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations for the uh, uh, Yang-Mills field are just d a star f a equals 0. And we could go through the computations for so the gauge field, the, the symmetries. Uh, in this case, the infinitesimal symmetries are maps u from the domain manifold. It, it doesn't matter what the domain manifold is. At this point, I'll call it m, into uh, the Lie algebra. And uh, we need to know the, the variation of the, uh, the uh, sorry, the, of the, of the Connection one form is dA of u. Okay, so now we go through and we apply our machine that Nurtuk constructed. And so what do we actually find is, is that we, we actually find in kind of a naive way that the, uh, the, uh, diver the, the, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, vector field, because we're not moving space. This is something that entirely happens in the fiber. And so there's only a p. So it's only a question of computing p. And uh, we compute, uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll write down what the divergence is, because that, the divergence of p is just uh, d uh, wedge f a star f a uh, times u times, sorry, uh, God, I'm, I'm, uh, of, sorry, divergence of p is equal to star 
let me write it d uh, d a q yeah I, I've got the right number of things there but now I got it right okay and of course th this is just a straightforward calculation but now if you throw in the Euler Lagrange equations you'll actually get that this is star d squared of star f a so uh, uh, so it's zero again right it's not uh, identically zero in this such way so again we don't get it no conservation we don't get any conservation loss so the the fact is is that uh, uh, gauge field theory also fits into this strange group of uh, what what she calls improper group symmetries. Okay, uh, yeah, I had one more thing uh, to do, was to to to. Uh, uh, okay, that's sorry. Okay, well, uh, I guess I wanted to do one more problem just to finish up. And that was is to calculate. Uh, the, uh, I'm just going to get, re, get, get you uh, a problem that we already did from general relativity. So uh, this is the basis for the Imabi problem. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm simply the Imabi problem. And in this case, we actually take a base metric. And uh, exactly what am I doing differently? Well, I'm taking a base metric. And that, uh, so d i j. And I look at g i j equal to uh, delta i j times a scalar to the power. OK? And, uh, so this scalar, so this is what's known as the conformal change in the metric. And the Imabi problem is, is given any metric on a manifold, when can I make a conformal change to get a constant scalar curvature metric? OK, so that's what the problem is. But I, I want to show you. So th it's, it's, you take the same integrand, R, G. And in this case, uh, it's the integral. And you actually have to mess around with it a bit. But, uh, but uh, uh, and actually, I'm going to put it, sorry, RG plus lambda uh, G dx. And we have to massage it a little bit, OK? And again, you don't really want to see how you actually go through these uh, massages. But if uh, I'll actually put in the constants. It's n minus 1, 2, 4 over n minus 2 squared times the integral of the norm of the derivative of rho to the 2n over n minus 2 squared plus the Laplacian, this is important, of uh, rho to the 2n over n minus uh, rho to the uh, Rho to the n minus 2 I, over 2. And uh, uh, Laplacian of uh, rho to the n minus 2. And there's a constant in here. And again, we have the integral of another constant, because I put this out in front, times my, I just have another Lagrange multiplier, times rho to the, uh, and I'm going to write it like this, 2 over n minus 2 times 2n over n minus 2 uh, dx. Now, what do we do is we simply integrate by parts and throw this away. But in integrating by parts, we threw away a divergence term. Okay, So we would not expect, so, so we, we actually throw this, we integrate this, this, this one by parts. Uh, we assume, uh, and we just throw it away. We don't actually consider it at all in the problem. And so now, if you look at it very carefully, this is just, if I let rho equal rho to the n minus 2 over 2 equal to f, you actually get the uh, 
nonlinear Dirichlet problem, uh, the, the nonlinear uh, Laplacian problem that I gave you in the beginning. In other words, it looks like with slightly different constants, it now looks like the uh, Lagrangian that came from the derivative of f squared. And I've got a different lambda over here, and the f here is 2n over n minus 2. Right. And this, as I showed you in the very beginning of the lecture, has perfectly good conservation laws. So uh, I'm not quite sure what that means exactly, except that if you throw away divergence terms, you may very well get a different answer. And so I, I have, uh, the next time I, you see, uh, I, I have as a summer project to actually understand what Noethe's definition is of an improper group action. But, and why, what she means by having a converse, because there's certainly not a converse. It's not true that if you have a conservation law, you have a group action. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>